Kim's going to come out with us. Oh, oh, yeah, uh, oh that's perfect. Yeah. That, that goes in. That's perfect. Good morning. Would you stand and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ? As you're finding your way back to your seats, we want to welcome you to worship this morning, especially those of you who are worshiping with us for the first or second, third time, I don't know. Anybody still feeling new around here, we are glad that you're with us. A few announcements for you. If you would sign the red uh, friendship pad located in your pew and pass that down, that helps us know who is here. And you can also use it to indicate whether or not you'd like us to reach out for any reason. That would be wonderful. There's two pages of announcements printed in your bulletins today, the last two pages. We encourage you to read those. Everything that we think you need to know is printed there in the bulletin, so you have no excuses. Read it. It's there. Uh, that would be great. Uh, project transformation is still in planning stages. We are looking, as I think, still looking for some readers. It's taking place June 10 through 13 at First, Pres uh, First Cumberland Presbyterian Church, right over here. Um, if you would be interested in reading uh, uh, to some kids at Project Transformation on Tuesday and Thursday, please check out the announcement in the bulletin and make contact with us so that we can get you down. That would be wonderful. Uh, you may also see, or you will begin to see, if you haven't already, that I'm putting, a, I've put a survey out there. Uh, raise your hand if you've completed my survey. Look at there. Wow. I know. That's good. Thank you. I need all of you to do it. <laughs> this is the beginning of my research for my doctoral dissertation, and this survey is kind of launching it. So if you would please follow the links to that. There's hard copies in the, in the um, Welcome Center area. It's a very uh, short survey, but I appreciate your help uh, in that. I'll be harassing you for the next month or so. Um, until I get, we get enough of those completed. It's really fun, trust me. And then finally, well not finally, but the last one for me, next Sunday we begin our summer schedule for worship. So that means Sunday school starts at 9, and worship starts at 10.15. One service starts next Sunday. No worship at 8.30. If you come at 11, you'll be a little late. That's okay. Uh, but Which happened. It does happen, yeah. It happened. Just act natural, if that's you. Um, eight, uh, 9 o'clock Sunday school, 10.15 worship next week. And John's got one more announcement. Yeah, 11 o'clock. You're the ones who typically forget uh, about the 10.15. I just want to let you know. It looks awkward because you're showing up right as I'm finishing preaching. And it looks like you just didn't want to hear the sermon. Like, I want to come to everything except for the sermon. Hey, just to let y'all know, uh, and as many of you have read, uh, through the generosity of a family... Uh, we are going to have major work done to our church organ. Uh, the company that we're using is out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They assure me that this will not disrupt uh, worship, but I said, hey, I don't know if you've worked with Scottish Presbyterians before, but we're the most flexible group in the world. I mean, we're, we love change. Anytime there's change in worship, y'all email me and go, man, I love that change. That was fantastic. So just be flexible with us. This will be a kind of a construction site uh, this week as they have to remove pipes and begin the process of rebuilding the organ. Say a prayer for me. Say a prayer for Jocelyn because I'm the one always in her ear. All that being said, let's prepare our hearts, minds, and souls for worship.
The desert in the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the cactus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord. The splendor of our God. Let us worship the Lord. As I mentioned in the 8.30 service, the poet laureate of my generation, Bruce Springsteen, reminds us that there's just a meanness in this world. And that meanness wears us down, burdens our hearts. 
is heavy lifting. So much so that we find ourselves so often reflecting the world in our Savior. And yet the Gospel of John reminds us that God so loved this world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believe in Him shall not perish, but have life and life eternal. God sent His Son not to condemn us, not to judge us, not to make us feel guilty. God sent His Son, according to the Gospel, to save us. So I invite you to confess what our God already knows. Our faults, our failures, our mistakes. First, as the body of Christ then in the silence of our own hearts. Let us pray. God of grace, we hide in our hearts the deepest regrets of our souls. We are ashamed to reveal that which the cross has already claimed. May we bring to light what is comfortable staying in the dark. May we believe that the promise of grace is truly for us. Forgive us for the sins we hide and the sins we ignore. Separate us from our transgression by your great hand of mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. My dear friends, hear and believe the good and great news of the gospel. I tell you the truth. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. seated. The great theologian reminds us the sacrament, that which of the Lord's Supper and of baptism are a physical sign of God's invisible grace. And on this day, the parents of Hudson Gray have claimed that promise for their son, representing the session in the congregation as Joanna Riggs, I'd invite the family and Bobby and I to come down to the font. Listen to the words of Jesus Christ from the book of Matthew. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And this also from the book of Acts. This promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls. And so obeying the words of Jesus Christ and confident of his promises, we do baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us, and God marks us as one of God's own. And when we baptize our children, together we claim that God initiates a relationship with us, that God's love comes to us even before we can choose to receive it. And it's by the waters of baptism that in some mysterious way, God's grace comes near, and we're made members of God's covenant family. It's here, in this font, where our journey with Christ begins. Let us pray. Holy God, as we come once again to this font, 
we are humbled to be called your sons and daughters. Who are we that you would bring us out of darkness and into your marvelous light? We give you thanks for the grace and love that you pour into our hearts through your Holy Spirit. This morning we remember that your son Jesus Christ was baptized and anointed in the Jordan River. You've set us free through his resurrection and through these waters we're born again. Loving God as Hudson's church family, may all of us together nurture and guide him in life and faith. Strengthen us to join in your work, coming alongside Zach and Maria as they raise Hudson so that he might come to know and love and follow and trust your son, Jesus Christ. And may we continue to love and care for Addie as she does the hard work of being a gentle and loving big sister. Now, Lord, fill this place, pour out your Holy Spirit upon these waters, and may all who pass through them be brought into true life. Bind Hudson to the household of faith and guard him from all evil. And enable all of us to love and serve you with joy until the day you make all things new. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Maria, I don't, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I want to point out that you were in our youth group when Leela and I first got here. I had the great privilege of officiating at your wedding, and then Natty's baptism, and now Hudson's. Uh, so I will ask you the questions of your baptism. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you promise to be his faithful disciple in this world? Do you renounce evil and sin in this world? All right. Yeah. What is the Christian name of this boy? Hudson, David, Joseph, Gray. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Addie, you want to come? So Addie and I want to present to you Hudson. He is a child of the covenant. The scriptures are clear that God knew him before he was formed in his mother's womb. God knew him by name and claimed him as his very own. And Addie and I want to remind you, go back this way, that you too have made a promise that you will raise Hudson to know the love of Jesus Christ and that you will walk with him every step of the way. Pray with me. Heavenly Father and gracious God, on this day we give you thanks for this big boy. Uh, <laughs> and we thank you, O Lord, for the love that you have for him, for his parents, for his big sister. Now, Lord, be with us all. And may we all remember our baptism. Amen. Amen.
good. Are there any other children in the church? If there are, they can come down. Gray, I'm going to talk about you in two seconds. You may want to come down. How's everyone? Y'all did great. What a beautiful song. It is so good to see y'all today. And I know y'all are getting close to what? So, well, I was saying school getting out, but sure, <laughs> second grade. That sounds great. Good. Okay. Good. So as you know, for the past several Sundays, we have been talking about something, and it hasn't been the tomb being empty. It's been what? What have we been talking about? Cicadas, right? And Bobby's been making us talk about cicadas. And when he, when he first brought that up, I was like, why are we talking about cicadas, Bobby? They're going to be here sooner than later, and we're going to get tired of them. And do you remember what Bobby said the first time we started talking about cicadas? Do you remember what he said? He said they were cute. Yeah, they are. And nice. They are. Look at this thing. That's not cute. That's not nice. Yes, they are. And you know, and do you know what? After that first Sunday, and you know how I give the benediction and then I go outside, Gray Hunt came up to me. And you know what he said? Look at here, John, and he showed me what? Cicada. He wasn't scared of that cicada. You know why? Bobby told him he didn't have to be scared of the cicada. Why? Because they're cute and harmless, Bobby said, right? So I started thinking about that. Are they really that cute? And are they really that harmless? And then all of a sudden, it's one thing, you know, when they're not really here yet, but now they're everywhere, right? In fact, at 8.30, I was staring. You can see them flying by the stained glass. And Addie's uncle brought one into the church. They're everywhere. <laughs> they're absolutely everywhere. As a matter of fact, the other day, I was leaving the office to go home to go run the dogs, and you could hear them buzzing and singing and everything. And I'm in the car heading home, and all of a sudden, I hear it. What do I hear? The cicada. And I slowly, slowly looked. And it was right on my shoulder. But you know what? I remember what Pastor Bobby said. They're cute and they're harmless. And I remember what Gray said. They don't hurt as he held it in his hands. So I just let that little cicada sit on my shoulder all the way home. Then we stopped the car in front of the house. I slowly opened the door. I grabbed the cicada. I took him to a bush, and I introduced him to some other cicadas because <laughs> he was a downtown corner of College and Springs cicada, not Richland Place. And I introduced him, and I said, here are some other cicadas. Maybe you can find a girlfriend. I don't know. That's how Bobby said they work. I don't know. All that being said is that sometimes things that are unknown are scary. But once you get to know the unknown, once you are told that, hey, it's going to be okay, you know what? It's going to be okay. So according to Stacy Webb, we only have to live with them for what, three more weeks? Something like that. And then they'll be gone. And then 13 years later, Thomas, how old will you be in 13 years? <laughs> I'll be retired, and uh, they'll be back. So why don't we do this? Why don't you bow your heads? Close your eyes and pray after me. Thank you, God, for cicadas. Thank you for this creation that you have blessed us with. We love you because you first loved us. Amen. All right, guys, y'all did a great job. Let's do it quick. Quick, that's not quick. Go, go. There you go, Peter. Go ahead. There you go. There you go. Bobby, this is way long. There you go. Good. 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 Got yours? All right. All great. Good. There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go.
be 21 the next time the cicadas come back. Good morning. Good morning. Dios misericordioso, prometiste nunca romper tu pacto con nosotros en medio de todas las palabras. Cambiaste, cambiaste de nuestra generación. Habla tu palabra eterna. Que no cambie entonces, respondamos a tus promesas de gracias con vida y fieles. Obedientes por nuestro Señor Jesucristo. Amén. La lectura está en Salmos 104, del 24 al 34. Oh Señor, cuán múltiples son tus obras, con sabiduría los has hecho a todos. La tierra está llena de tus criaturas. Allá en el mar grande y ancho hay innumerables reptiles, seres vivos, tanto pequeños como grandes. Allí van las, na allí van las aves y el, le el leviatán, leviatán que formaste para jugar, para jugar en, todos los, en todos ellos. Esperan de ti que dé su aliento, que les dé su alimento a su debido tiempo. Cuando les das a ellos, lo recogen cuando abres la mano, están llenos de cosas buenas. Cuando escondes tu rostro, se espantan. Cuando les quitas el aliento, mueren y vuelven a su polvo. Cuando él, cuando él envíe sus espíritus, son creados y renuevan la faz de la tierra. Que la gloria del Señor permanezca para siempre. Que el Señor se regocije en sus obras. Que la, que la mirada, la tierra y tiembla, que toca los montes y, y humea. Cantaré al Señor mientras viva, cantaré alabanzas a mi Dios mientras exista. Que, me, que mi meditación se le agra, sea agradable porque me, regoci, me regocijaré en el Señor. Amén.
So our sermon text for this uh, Pentecost Sunday and Senior Sunday are coming from uh, 1 and 2 Timothy, but we're going to do things a little bit differently today. I'm not going to read the sermon text at the beginning of the sermon like we normally do. It's kind of spread out throughout the, the sermon. Uh, so we were talking about their flexibility. I know this will be no problem. Uh, let's begin with prayer. God, we do give you thanks for the chance to gather together as your people to worship you. Now send your Holy Spirit to be with us. Open our hearts and minds to your word. We pray all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, every day is special, right? Every day we get a new start, a do-over, a new chance. Every day we wake up. But not every day is equally memorable. Some days are more memorable than others. My hope today is that today is a day that we never forget, because today we get to honor and celebrate our students who are graduating from high school this year. But today is not just about their graduation. It's about everything that came before today, and it's also about everything that's going to come after today. This summer, I turned 46 years old. I graduated from high school 28 years ago in 1996. For me, high school feels like a long time ago. I know maybe not, that sounds really close to you all, but it's starting to feel like it was a long time ago. But there is a lot that I remember. I remember my senior year. I remember the tests, my final tests that I had to take. I remember the parties. I remember winter formal and senior prom. I remember signing yearbooks with my friends and playing music. We had those nice systems in our cars, you know, that played loud music. We were so proud of those. We played music way too loud in the church, or the school parking lot. Got busted for that. I remember having conversations about everybody's summer plans. But maybe more than anything, I remember lots of adults wanting to give me advice about college. I knew one thing for sure. I had this feeling that I was on the threshold of a big change. Our high school students are perhaps feeling something like that now. The feeling that transition is on the horizon. It's imminent. And as exciting as this can be, with transition comes perhaps a little bit of fear and uncertainty. Sometimes a lot of fear and uncertainty. And so oftentimes I think we feel conflicted in moments like these. On the one hand, we're ready for it. One of the best parts about being 18 years old and growing up is this feeling of being ready for anything, ready to do things for ourselves, to be independent, to be self-sufficient. But on the other hand, we feel kind of sad, too. Looking forward to something new, we get the sense that life's never going to be the same, or definitely not the same as it was in school. And so maybe we wander around our house and we think, will I ever live here again? Or maybe we spend time with our friends and we wonder, if, will, I really, will we really stay in touch Yes, a lot of change is about to happen in the lives of our seniors, and I want us to acknowledge that. But as true as that is, and it is true, I do want to talk about something that won't change, and that is our role as their church family. Students, I see one, two, and three, and I'll tell you later, Sarah Com is not here. She wishes she could be here, but she's not. Students, every year there are people like you graduating from high school, leaving home, or some staying home. They go to work, they go to college, who for one reason or another lose sight of their faith. There's lots of reasons why this might happen. Maybe it's because of something a professor says, or because they don't see how their faith works in the real world. Maybe it's because they just get out of the habit of going to church or going to youth group. Maybe they move to a new city and they have a hard time finding a church that they like or they forget to even look for a church. Or maybe they forget why it even matters that looking for a church is important at all. Whatever the reason, their faith starts to dwindle. It becomes unused and eventually feels completely unnecessary. But this is also the time when a lot of students feel like their churches completely abandoned them. A youth pastor friend of mine once had a student say, I've never felt more deserted by our church than the day after I graduated high school. 
Ouch. Graduation can feel like a goodbye for a lot of reasons, but it should not feel that way when it comes to the church. When we look at our high school seniors, we don't see a finish line. As a church, we see an investment. We see the countless adults who have poured their time and their energy to invest in these students over the years. The volunteers and the mentors and the teachers, folks who've worked hard to teach you all what it means to follow Jesus, to love God, and to love others. Folks who've walked beside you guys in fun times, like retreats and church trips and youth groups and things like that, but then also folks who've walked beside you through times that weren't so good. These men and women aren't perfect, we all know that, but they're committed, they're faithful, and I think that's what's important. There are so many people who have poured into the lives of our seniors, some of which these students have gotten to know and they've seen, others have worked behind the scenes. All of them, investing their time, investing their energy to make the students' experience at FPC the best it could be. And so when we look at these seniors, this is what we see. The hours and hours that people who care about them have poured into them. But that's not all. When we see these students, we also see the incredible investment that they have made into our church community, to our work participating in God's mission in the world helping out as leaders to younger kids, attending mission trips, sharing their faith, experimenting with what it means to put their faith into action. We as a church want to make sure that our students feel prepared for what's next, which is why we want to make sure that the message to you all is very clear. Students, we are not leaving you. Your church is not abandoning you. We are not saying goodbye to you. We want to help you say, hello world. And to do that well, we want to help you transition into the next season by helping you pack your bags. Here's one thing that I've learned uh, along the way. When life has brought you to a transition, what you pack is important. Ultimately, what goes into our bags is up to us. We get to, to decide what to include and what not to include. It's our responsibility. This is especially true for our students as they head into this next chapter of their lives, but it's true for any of us who are in the midst of a transition in life. As you can see, I brought my rolly suitcase with me. As we look at some scriptures from First and Second Timothy, I want to share with the students some of the things that are already in their luggage and I want to invite them to take a few additional things along as well. I do think it's appropriate that we're using Paul's letter to Timothy. We've been in this text for the past several weeks. You remember Paul is like Timothy's mentor. He invested in Timothy. He spoke truth and belief and purpose into him. And in these two letters, we get insight into some of the things that Paul passed along to Timothy. What do we know about their relationship? Well, we know that Paul traveled to Lystra, where Timothy lived. We know that Timothy's mother was a Jewish believer in Jesus, and his father was Greek. We know that the believers in Lystra and Iconium spoke very well of Timothy because he'd already uh, built a pretty solid reputation there. We know that Paul wanted to take Timothy with him on an upcoming missionary journey. We also know that because there were a lot of Jews where Paul was going, Paul wanted Timothy to be circumcised, which is a sign of Judaism. And Timothy did it, which is commitment. And so Paul and Timothy did a lot of ministry together. And Timothy sort of learned the ropes from Paul. But they also went through a transition where Timothy began doing this missionary work on his own. And so when Timothy left on those trips, his bags were packed, he was ready to go. And so we're going to look at three things that Timothy knew as he packed his bags. And these three things were the result of the investment that Paul had made in Timothy. First, Timothy knew that Paul was behind him. Timothy had become family to Paul. He says it over and over again. In the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians, we see that Paul thought of Timothy like a son in the faith. 
He wrote, But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son is with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. And Paul writes something similar in 1 Corinthians. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. And then also at the beginning of his first and second letter to Timothy. To Timothy, my dear son, grace and mercy from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul uses the term son 19 times in his letters to Timothy. My son, my true son, my son whom I love, my son in the faith. In other words, Paul and Timothy's relationship was not merely a friendship. Paul saw Timothy as family. And so students, before you go, we want you to know the same thing. Just like Timothy knew that Paul was behind him, we, your church, are behind you. Folks, can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. The first thing that you're going to pack is this, this picture. We're giving each of the students a picture of some of the people who have been in their past. Students, we want to remind you that you have a history with us, but it's not over. We will continue to be around. Think of us like an anchor for you, supporting you as life changes, which it will. We know that you have parents who birthed you and fed you and wiped you and cleaned you and you know, raised, you, raised you through the awkward years and all that. We know we didn't do that, but we still want you to know that you are our family. We are behind you. And when you know someone is behind you, you can do almost anything. When you know someone is behind you, you can face almost anything and you can get through almost anything. Secondly, Timothy knew that Paul was with him. Listen to 2 Timothy 1, verses 3 and 4. Paul says, I thank God, whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I might be filled with joy. I think we get a little glimpse into Paul's heart here. Even though distance and obstacles had separated them, Paul never stopped thinking and praying for Timothy. Paul was in a Roman prison when he writes these words to Timothy, and he never stopped praying. Students, this is true for you as well, as though hopefully we are not doing our praying for you from any prisons. You all have people who love you and who support you. You all have people who want you to know how much they love you and support you and will be praying for you. I would imagine when Timothy was feeling frustrated or overwhelmed or out of his league, he would remember Paul's letters and remember what Paul's letters represented, that Paul was with him and was praying for him. Timothy knew that Paul was with him, and we, your church, are with you. Can I get another amen? Thank you. So you'll also, I highly doubt you'll forget this one, You'll want to pack one of these. If Paul could have, I imagine he would have texted Timothy all the time. But since the iPhone had not been invented yet, Paul wrote letters instead. He was encouraging Timothy and building him up. And Timothy held on to those messages wherever he went. And in the same way, we want our students to know that we are with them. We are praying for them. Students, we're here to remind you, just like you have a past with us, you also have a present with us. We're always with you. We've been praying for you since you were a little bitty, and our prayers for you are not going to stop. We're praying for you now as well. As a matter of fact, whoop, I just texted the four of you. You should be getting a text from me any second telling you how much your church loves you. And you can look forward to more messages like that, more messages from your church family. You can look forward to receiving these 
boxes filled with junk food and knickknacks a few times every year. All of this is to let you know that we, your church family, are with you. We're praying for you. We love you. And we are on your side. And we're going to send these messages and we're going to send those packages to whatever address you give us. Even if you live at home, yes, it's true. We want to remind you that we are still with you right here. Thirdly, Timothy knew that Paul was for him. Listen to the mission Paul gives Timothy in 2 Timothy 1. Timothy, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. In a lot of ways, life after high school is hard. Following Jesus in high school is not easy, but following Jesus out of high school once you've graduated, I think, is a little more complicated. Students, you may have days where you feel ashamed, but here it's as if Paul is saying, listen, Timothy, if you ever feel embarrassed about following Jesus or you feel ashamed or embarrassed to do the right thing, don't forget that I'm behind you. I'm with you, and I'm for you. We know that it's not only faith that's going to be hard in the next stage of our students' lives. There are going to be days that are hard for totally different reasons. When you guys, I doubt any of you will fail a class, but I have that in my notes. When you fail a class, when you don't get into a club, or you miss a deadline or something, or you're late for an assignment, you make a big mistake, or you disappoint someone that you care about, or someone who you care about hurts you, Students, you're going to have days where you feel like you've let yourself down or you've let someone else down. But listen to what Paul tells Timothy. He says, Jesus has saved us and called us to a holy life. By the way, this is what God wants for every single one of us, every single person on earth. God wants us to make choices that reflect the life that God intends for us. And students, we want you to know and to believe that this is true for you so that you can live from a place of love and acceptance, not from a place of shame and fear. And when we live knowing that there's lots of people who are for us, living from a place of love and acceptance becomes much, much easier. Well, Paul goes on in this this sentence. Jesus has saved us and called us to live a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Timothy knew that Paul was for him. And students, we want you to know that your church is for you. Can I get one more amen? Amen. Last thing. Look at here. (laughs) It's a laundry bag, students. Like I said earlier, even if we're slightly nervous or anxious about this stage of our lives, all of us feel a sense of excitement about what's coming. There's the feeling of having a blank slate. You know, a university, a university, (laughs) a universe of possibilities. Endless uh, experiences and things to explore. Chances are, expectations for how we want this next stage of your lives to go are pretty high. We have high expectations. And in some ways, our expectations and yours will be met. Things will fall into place like we hope and like we anticipate, but not everything will. Like any other time in life, there's going to be disappointments, moments when our expectations are not met because of maybe something that's happened or because of something that we've done. And it can start to feel in life like all the good stuff that we wanted, that we planned for, that we worked for, needs to just be tossed out like a bunch of dirty clothes. But students, you need to know, and you've heard this before, but let me remind you that there is nothing, nothing that God cannot work in the midst of, that God cannot make right, that God cannot clean, that God cannot make whole. This is the nature of who God is and what God does. And so we're here to remind you that you have a future with us, no matter what. You're always welcome back home, no matter what you've done or not done, no matter where you've gone or not gone. gone. 
You, we are for you. When things work out and everything's going the way that you want and life is fantastic and you're pleasantly surprised, wonderful. You're welcome. You're welcome here. When things don't work out, things have gone wrong, you are welcome here. In the beginning of his second letter to Timothy, Paul charges Timothy with a task. Paul writes, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit. All of this is possible. All these things are made possible by the gift of the Holy Spirit that was given to the church and given to us on Pentecost Sunday. Paul was facing the hardest time of his life when he wrote these words to Timothy. He's in prison. He knows he will soon be executed. He knows that guarding the gospel and living by the gospel is not always easy, but it's what's important, and it's what's required, and it's the pathway to living life to the full. And because Timothy knew that Paul was behind him and with him and for him, he was able to do the work, complete the task. Students, at the end of the day, this is all we want for you. We want to protect the investment that we've made in you, that God has made in you, as well as the investment that you have made in us. The investments made here have all been working toward one end goal, that you would have the gospel inside you, the good news of Jesus inside of you, and that the gospel would drive your life decisions. So when you pack your bags, remember Because God is behind you, we are behind you. Because God is with you, we are with you. And because God is for you, we are for you and for your future. At the center of any difficulty, at the center of any challenges you face, you have an anchor holding you fast, the resurrected Christ. At the center of any anxiety, any uncertainty, any stress, you have the support and prayers of your church family, the Holy Spirit of God is with you at all times. And if you happen to mess up, which you will, we all speak from experience, through Jesus Christ, God has run to you, God has embraced you, and God has welcomed you, no matter what. So this is not goodbye. This is hello world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, would you join me standing now as we... Confess what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. And I'll tell you that some of the students have already texted me back since we've been sitting here. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please be seated. Lord be with you. Pray with me. O Heavenly Father and gracious God, on this day of Pentecost, we truly give you thanks for the gift of the Holy Spirit. On that first day, O Lord, through your Holy Spirit, you bonded us together as the body of Christ. Though we come from the east and the west and the north and the south, though we speak in many different languages, we are of one body, of one faith. For that, we are truly grateful. And understanding this, we, the people of the corner of college and spring, we recognize we are not the only game in town. So we thank you for the church here in Murfreesboro, and in Rutherford County, in Tennessee, and to the ends of the earth. May we continue the good work of your Son, our Savior, until he comes again. And so as we recognize the work of the church, O oh Lord, we truly recognize this world is broken, that there are those in need and want, those who suffer, those who weep. As a community, we remember today the Sullivan family. And we thank you for the life lived by Asher. We pray, O oh Lord, that as a community we may stand with this family and to show them your grace and your love. Yet we also recognize, O oh Lord, that in our community there are children in need, children who need help in reading, children who will go hungry this summer, children who seek hope. May we be the manifestation of your hope to this world. And so out of faith, O oh Lord, we boldly pray the prayer you, Son, taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, my friends, let us continue our time in worship by giving our tithes and our offerings to the Lord.
God, we give you thanks for all the gifts that you give us. We know that everything we have comes from you. And so we pray that you would receive what we give back, our money, our time, our energy, that you would redeem it, and that it would be used to further your kingdom in this world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As our time of worship, you guys go ahead and be seated. One more thing. I'd like to invite our uh, seniors and uh, parents, any parents who are here with them, to join me up front, please, right now. Family, you can bring the whole family. It doesn't matter. Anybody with you in worship, come up. Come on up. It feels good to have people with you, right? Oh, great, the cicadas. I can hear him already. My friends, uh, up here we have three of four of our graduating seniors. Jesse Magoon with family. Uh, Jesse will be going to UTC uh, next year, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Grayson Gritton here with his mom. Uh, Dad's en route with Patrick back from the Northeast. And Grayson's going to, uh, don't tell me, Wake Forest next year. And then Abby Lugos with her family, and Abby's going to UTK. Knoxville next year. That's right. Um, students, I hope you're listening in my sermon uh, today. Go back and listen to it later if you didn't. Uh, but high school graduation takes you across an invisible threshold, really between, I would say, between like adolescence and adulthood in a lot of ways, uh, whether you're ready for it or not. You are on the brink of a legitimate life transition, possibly one of the biggest life transitions of your lives so far. And so as your church family, we really do want you to feel us leaning in and supporting you as you're making this transition. This final moment of worship is not so we can say goodbye to you and shove you off into the, uh, into the wild, into the sea, but uh, to help you say hello to the world and hello to this next chapter of your lives. And we hope that you can feel that. And we do, as always, have a few gifts for you to take with you. We have the, uh, as you, if you were paying attention, there's pictures for each of you uh, from some of your past experiences here. Look at those confirmation pictures when you guys started. You're so little. Um, we have those pictures. We also have uh, the laundry bags. I know. Do you have a laundry bag yet? Congratulations. Yeah. You'll need that. If it ever gets full, that's a huge laundry bag. Um, good for you. And then also... Um, there's two more things. We have this book. I give this book to the seniors every year. It's available on the resource table, too, if anybody else wants to buy a copy. Uh, this book has changed my life more than once. I highly recommend you read this book twice a year for the rest of your lives. I'm not joking. That's a real thing that I think you should do. It would be time well spent. It's very thin, too. You can read it quickly. Uh, Henry Nouwen's book, In the Name of Jesus. 
Let me read you a small little snippet out of there. Nowen says that the greatest message that we have to carry as followers of Jesus is that God loves people not because of what people do or what people accomplish. God loves us because God has created and redeemed us in love and has chosen to proclaim that love as the source of all life. I know that's really deep, uh, but that's just a little bit of what you can look forward to in there. Uh, my honest recommendation, seriously, twice a year, rest of your lives. Okay, and then finally, we have a prayer shawl for each of you. This prayer shawl ministry that our church has, Grayson, hmm, uh, takes care of our church members in a very unique way, making these prayer shawls. The, the, the team that makes these prays for you while they make them. Um, and these will keep you warm and cozy if you're ever needing to feel warm and cozy. And they're going to remind you everything I said in the sermon, that this is a group of people who are behind you, who are for you, and who are with you, and these prayer shawls are a very tangible reminder of that. Parents, this might be a challenging time for you. I'm not sure. You know, some parents seem really excited and, you know, want to get the kids out of the house. Others are really broken up about it. Um, But we want you to know, too, that your church is also behind you and for you and with you. We want to feel, we want you to feel the church leaning in to you as well, because this is a transition for the whole house. And for the families. Uh, And if anything, I would say your work is not finished as parents. When kids go off to college, you know that. Um, If anything, it's time to double down. Um, And so we're with you as well. Okay, students, now it's time to receive God's blessing. Class of 2024, there is no doubt that God has big plans for each of you. Uh, We know this because God always has big plans for God's family. My favorite verse to read here is Jeremiah 29, 11. God says, this is God, for I know the plans I have for y'all, which is the correct word, by the way. It's not you, like one person. It's for you all. I know the plans I have for y'all, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper y'all and not harm y'all. Plans to give y'all hope and a future. These are God's promises for us, and we're grateful for them. Church family, As I said just a moment ago, this morning is about helping these students transition into this next chapter of their lives. And so it's important that they experience us leaning into them. And I think it's important that they experience or they hear from us as well. And so please stand, if you would now, as we're approaching the benediction, and repeat after me. Students, listen carefully. This is not goodbye. This is not goodbye. We welcome you in a new way. We welcome you in a new way. You're not going into the next season alone. You're not going into the next season alone. This is your place. This is your place. We are your people. We are your people. We are behind you. We are behind you. We are with you. We are with you. And we are for you. We are for you. We love you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Before the charge and benediction, let's pray for these Students, students, would you come stand here closer to me and families, would you gather around them? Let's pray. Faithful and loving God, in baptism you have claimed us, and we know that by your Holy Spirit you're working in our lives, transforming us from the inside out. God, we know that every journey has multiple beginnings and endings, and every step is something new. And in this moment, we lift to you these students your sons and daughters, the ones you love, and we pray that you would protect and guide them in this next chapter of their lives. Bless them, Lord, and establish your truth in them, that they would grow in faith and hope and love. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, who is our Savior and our friend. Amen. Amen. Benediction. Benediction. My friends, this is what it looks like to be the church gathered, so now we have to be the church dispersed. Wherever we go, Christ goes. Whatever we do, Christ does. Whatever we say, Christ says. And so we get to be the, possibly, the only encounter someone has with the idea of a God who welcomes, a God who restores, a God who gives grace. The world can experience that through us. And so go now with God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's children say one more time, Amen. Amen.
Go in peace.